I'm Sean Fennessy. I'm Amanda Dobbins. And this is The Big Picture, a conversation show about Francis Ford Coppola. Today on the show, we are discussing Megalopolis, the decades in the making passion project from one of our signature American filmmakers. We'll talk about the film and its quality and our hilarious screening experience seeing this movie together. And we'll build Coppola's Hall of Fame together. This is also the last episode in theory before Amanda goes on leave. Yes. When you're listening to this, one way or another, I'm on leave. Yeah, that's right. Right? You know, I like. What's I, the like, other way? I, I don't know. You know, we're in the phase. Who can say what happened? Okay. But I did many months ago. I set my my ship, my stars, my calendar by <laughs> Megalopolis, and I'm proud to say I made it. I've seen the film. I'm not in labor yet. We're recording this, and this is the last. I, like technically, it's pre-recorded, but. You know, only barely, and I gotta just say, take my hat off to you. Thank you. You are an absolute star. Thank you. I'm so impressed with you. I've been kicking to do ass it. all I week. I mean, it's here. We've been waiting. No, you're you're doing amazing, and uh, you know that's that's maybe the last time I'll use the word amazing for the next thirty minutes <laughs> well, or so. No, I think the amazing has different connotations. <laughs> it's that's a good point. Uh, amazing in that this is powered by stars in a unique way. Mm-hmm. Uh, what that power is is something we'll sort through. So, Megalopolis, of course. One of the most anticipated movies, I think, of my lifetime. It's a movie that started in the imagination of Coppola in 1977, which is a smack dab in the middle of one of the most remarkable decades in American movie making. And he's been plotting and scheming and reconstituting and refiguring this movie over a very, very long period of time. We've read an entire book about how this movie has yes. lived inside of Coppola. We talked about that book a few months ago on the podcast, uh, Sam Watson's fascinating story of Coppola's life and career. And the movie's finally here. We had heard out of the Cannes Film Festival, I would say mixed reviews, sure. largely negative, but there were, it ha- this movie has its defenders. It's and celebrants it, also. It, it, it does. It does. And, um, I then there was a long period where we were concerned that we would not be able to see it because um in addition to plotting this for 40 years Francis Ford Coppola financed this movie himself sold off part of his wine business uh reportedly cost 120 million at least to make which he funded and so he went to Cannes without a distributor and it premiered there for the lucky people who went to France uh we were not among them talk to Sean <laughs> and then there was also a screening here for, you know, the the industry's elite mm-hmm. um, that I would say to not go as uh, Coppola might have hoped. I'm glad you brought that up. And and but so we di- it didn't have distribution for a long time. And we actually did not know when we the movie going public, just fans of cinema would actually be able to see Megalopolis. So that screening in particular, which was widely covered in the trades, and you could see the both sides in the trades coverage. There were initial stories about how the film was very poorly received, and it was a real what's it, and the executives who were there to potentially acquire the film had had no idea what to make of it, but they didn't like it. Right. And then there was some ex post facto coverage that was like, actually, it was a great success, and here's why, and here's mm-hmm. what Coppola thought in the aftermath of it. Some time went by before Lionsgate picked the movie up. I have since m- talked to, I, th- I would say about five people who were at that first screening. Mm-hmm. All five of them, without fail, were like, boy, this movie doesn't work. My goodness. And you know me. Yeah. My intention with this show, my intention with my movie going life is to love a movie. Like, I re- and if, a, if it's a movie from a great master, I really, really want to sure. love a movie. Like I want to, I want to understand it as a part of the fabric of their work. But I also, in the individual experience, want to have fun, want to learn something, want to feel deeply. Yeah, this you're is not like, a hater. This you, is I'm not a hater. You That's go it. to it's church for you. Yes, I want to. I want and I want to be praiseful and praiseworthy. Yeah. And um, I will just open this conversation by saying it pains me to say that I am not. Uh, praiseful of this movie. You're not one of the celebrants. I'm not. And and I think this will be an interesting way to talk through what is good about an idea versus what is good about the execution of an idea. And this sure. movie is an interesting example because of its incredible scope and theoretical imagination and its actual execution and failures thereof that, that make for a, a fascinating document of, of pop culture. It's an amazing piece of cinematic history. It is an incredible piece of performance art. Mm-hmm. 
and 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 an expression of Francis Ford Coppola's art and career over time that is like does feel essential to his narrative. It you does. and I um, were catching up with coworkers before we started recording this, and even plotting with Jack and Bobby how to open this, and we're just like really dancing around how many different ways can we say. The movie's like, not good. It didn't, yeah, it didn't work for us. It, yeah, it didn't not, work for us. It, it, the like, movie doesn't work. It, and I confess, like, I remained completely confounded by, like, almost <laughs> everything that I saw. Um, not, like, narratively, I, I, I guess. I know what the movie's about, um, but particularly visually and and tonally and from the the connection from what I understand of Coppola's intention and, and life's work and what I like madly respect. And then like what I saw on the movie screen, I have not yet been able to connect it. We've only seen it once. Yeah. We've only seen the two hour cut. You know, Jack was speculating maybe there's a four and a half hour cut that will restore everything and make sense. Maybe. It's Who possible. am I? And I let, let me also say like, I'm a little disappointed in myself. You know, like. How so? I. I wanted to go. I wa- I wanted to be one of the admirers. So let's talk about our screening experience yeah. before we get too much further into the movie. Because one, it's just we had a fun experience going yeah, to yeah, see yeah, this yeah, movie. Yeah. It was a unique way of seeing the movie. And two, I think that will inform how the world may receive it while we talk about what it is and what it is right. not. So we saw it together. You saw it in nine and a half months pregnant, God bless you, yeah. at an AMC um, across the country on this Monday night at IMAX theaters. This film was having a kind of one-time only experience, an immersive IMAX experience, it was called, where before the film, there was a Q&A between uh, Dennis Lim, who was one of the key curators at the New York Film Festival, and he was interviewing Francis Ford Coppola, Robert De Niro, who does not appear in this movie, and Spike Lee, who has nothing to do with this movie either. And let me also just say the Chirons identifying Robert De Niro and Spike Lee identified them as panelists. Yes. Rather, panelist Robert De Niro and yes. panelist Spike Lee. Not treasures to world cinema, <laughs> but panelists. The Q&A itself, which I, you know, I think Dennis Lim approached with uh, a sincerity and thoughtfulness, yeah. but very quickly veered out yeah. of his control, was a terribly strange way to begin our Megalopolis experience. Now, you and I come to this already knowing a lot about the production and history of Megalopolis. And Francis Ford Coppola comes prepared to talk through his own arcane (laughs) history of movie productions. And just about anything else that pops into his mind. Um, Yes. Among other things, the nation of Haiti and octopuses were discussed by Francis Ford Coppola. (laughs) James Dean, don't forget. Yeah, I truly, I, I cannot tell you how weird this was. It was incredibly entertaining. I loved it. Yes. And I had, you know, I had texted you the night before once I became aware that the Q&A would be preceding the movie and I was like, I don't know about this. Yes. Like, I don't know if I want to hear one of the great filmmakers of, I guess, our lifetimes, but also before our of, lifetimes. Of, in American of, movies. In, in American movies. Yeah. Just pontificate about Marcus Aurelius for like <laughs> three hours before his long movie. Um, you know, and I told Zach, my husband, people like make fun of the fact that I identify him as my husband. Mm-hmm. It's just a little disclaimer here. You know, we're okay. journalists. Who are um, people? I don't know, but when okay. he showed up on the the um the draft. Mm-hmm. What draft? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, everyone was like, oh, it's my husband, Zach Barron. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm sure I say it a lot, but I don't know. I don't know how many of you are listening all of the time. Don't don't apologize or even acknowledge such commentary. uh, I told Zach that there was going to be a QA and a before the screening. And he's like, okay, so I'll see you at midnight. (laughs) Uh, Because he has interviewed Francis Ford Coppola. (laughs) He interviewed him actually um, uh, right before the making of this movie. I think Mm -hmm. it was late 2021. Yep. Right before they were going to production. And it was a lot about it. And I think Zach would tell you it was, like, one of the great journalistic experiences of his life. Like, Coppola is a thinker and incredibly charming and a talker. But, like, my guy will just do, like, Balzac for 30 minutes in the middle, you know? And so and he, he sort of he, did. He basically was that in that. So this interview was live streamed around the country. It was taking place yeah. in New York, but we all saw it on the big IMAX screen. And Coppola was prepared. He was prepared to talk specifically about the ideas he cares about and also to veer off the roads. The presence of De Niro and Spike Lee was obviously they are legends of New York and they are friends of Coppola's and they're there to support him with the release of this movie. But, I mean, they had very little to to contribute. Right. And 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 also, the first question to them from Dennis Lim was, Bobby, Bob, 
Bobby. Bobby. How did you, um, do you remember meeting Francis for the first time? And before De Niro could wake up to speak, and I, I know I'm saying that, but I took like 18 different photos of the screen <laughs> and all of them, his eyes do look closed. I kept like waiting for a moment this where I could get De Niro's. Yeah. Um, I, I love him so much. What a treasure. But before De Niro could answer the question, Coppola just jumped in and was like, let me tell you this very long story about how Martin Scorsese maybe introduced us before Godfather, but I don't Wasn't remember. Wasn't a very good yeah. story. <laughs> I mean, most of these stories were not very good. Um, it was a remarkable thing. I guess it was roughly 35 minutes. Yeah. There was a detour in which Robert De Niro began speaking as he often does about how Donald Trump is a pox on our nation and should be eliminated. I he- think it's the, the direct quote was, and and this came after Coppola was trying to tie some of the themes of Megalopolis to the current moment, which I think he feels deeply and also is movie marketing, you know, and but never said the word Trump. And then just sort of unprompted, you know, like the like he woke up and De Niro just interjected, Donald Trump could not direct this movie, <laughs> which is a fact. You know, having seen the movie, what we're meant to take away from that observation is less clear to me, but... It's possible that no yeah. human could have directed this movie, which I'd like to... You know, there's no accounting for taste in presidential right. candidates, but uh, I thought that was a very odd way for De Niro to frame that aspect of this right. conversation. Nevertheless, <laughs> every time he talked... Structure? Yeah. <laughs> but, well, but every time De Niro talked, I was laughing because he... He was sort of like an on-message candidate. Like, he only knew how to talk about one thing. Spike, on the other hand, was just making jokes and cracking himself up and Mm -hmm. running off and coming back into his seat like he often does. You know, having a 35-minute preamble before a movie is not typically a good idea. Yeah. Um, I was just saying to you recently that even at Telluride, where the filmmaker comes out and presents their movie for like two minutes beforehand and tells you a little something about the movie that they've made. I'm like, I don't even want that. Like, I, you should be proud of it, and I'm, I'm happy to stay afterwards for the Q&A, but don't tell me anything before I sit down. I don't want to know anything. Right. But you did also, when I was bitching about it, say to me, and a fairly immortal quote, which is, you may be pregnant, but he's almost dead. Let him cook. <laughs> <laughs> which, fair, you know? Yes. And so, he cook he did. You know what? He's 85 years old, and he was tremendously cogent during all of his speaking before the film. Incredibly charming. Yes. Like It was weird and it it was not connected to anything and you and I were just having the time of our lives. It was a lot of fun. I was so happy. And so the, the energy in the room got a little bit noisier and happier and more excited, I think, even than it yeah. had been. It was it was a very cinephilic, pretty it was bro-y lit. screening. It was, a, it was a lot of, I don't, I shouldn't speak for anyone. This is stereotyping. You're talking to my boys right now? But I, I had a brutal boy's energy. Yeah. <laughs> I was almost run over by a seeming brutal boy and his dog. That who, Now that is a fucking party foul. Um, Don't bring your yo, goddamn dog to the movie theater. I 1000% agree. And you know how I feel about dog owners generally. Not dogs, dog owners. Um, that dog didn't make a peep. That's true. So, so shout good, out. Good dog. Listen, good dog. That was good, a good boy. And good yeah. responsibility. It was do not a, bring, just don't bring your dog to the It was movies. a little Please. alarming. Like, I don't, Please. I'm not like very nimble right now. So to like get out of the way of the brutal boy <laughs> and the dog and the leash, like before, because they were like rushing to not miss anything. And I was just like, this is very high stakes. People are really, really turned right now. I'm trying to imagine an alternate reality where you actually do get knocked over by a man and his dog in the hallway of the IMAX room and you're screaming in pain while the screening is about to transpire. Right. And, uh, and all the brutal boys are just like... Not now, lady. <laughs> There's cinema to consume. It was really notably uh, dudes heavy. There were many men. Yeah. yeah and many there, men. That's 50 cent one said. Many, there are often many men at at film events, you know? Yeah. But this to me, even and also lots of lots of young people, you know, which on, on the one hand, I love it. You know my take cinema. on that. Movies are back with young people. That's, That's true. Like, that, that, That's true. This kind of a thing, movies are back. Right. But why don't you why don't you tease out this kind of a thing, quote unquote? Well, the movie itself. I mean, let's just talk about it. We'll talk about it in depth before getting into the Hall of Fame. Um, we'll try to avoid spoilers in the early parts of the conversation. I would not say this is a terribly spoilerable film. There are events that transpire. There is a there is a, a there are character arcs. There are things that we'll talk about that happen. But when you're watching it, it does not feel like you're watching The Godfather. Um, it's something much different. The film itself is significantly more philosophical 
Um, but there are there is there are characters, there is a story. So in a decaying metropolis called New Rome, which is effectively Rome implanted into New York City. CGI into New York CGI'd. City. An architect named Caesar Catali- uh, Catalina is granted a license by the federal government to demolish and rebuild the city as a sustainable utopia using something called Megalon, which is a material that can give him the power to control space and okay. time. So, so th- that is all true, but is already like like if I were grading your paper. Mm-hmm. I would just be like, how do you know all of this? Mm-hmm. Like, you need to show... The film and- <laughs> does not clearly explain, particularly the part about the federal, federal government, government license. granting the license. Yes, sure. That part is very unclear. Now, right. it's very clear that he sort of controls Megalon, this right. material. And that's a lot of, like, spinning newspapers and stuff, right? It's the the golden material. No, 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 I say. know, but how, literally, how the information oh, how is it. communicated yes. to us, the yes. audience. yes. Is mostly like newsreels and you know fake cable news and ADR and dialogue. Yeah, sure, yeah, right. Yeah, which there's plenty of that in this film. <laughs> um, in the film, Caesar Catalina, who is played by Adam Driver, the great Adam Driver, uh, his nemesis is the mayor of New Rome. Right. His name is Franklin Cicero. Right. He's portrayed by Giancarlo Esposito, and he is trying to maintain Happy the status quo. Happy to announce that the name of my child is Franklin Cicero. <laughs> so Francis and I at least were alive. I, on that. I, I actually like that name. <laughs> I know. Um, I do too. Torn between them is Cicero's daughter, Julia, yeah. a socialite who we see early in the film, you know, fraternizing with uh, the, the 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 layabouts, the club goers right. of New Rome. Um, and Julia <laughs> is a beautiful woman who is looking for, I don't know, like a, a, her her fate, her destiny, clarity in life, love, unclear. It's a, a clear direction of which page we're filming today. Yeah. She's portrayed by Natalie Emanuel, who people remember from the Fast movies and from Game of Thrones. And the movie is essentially this kind of snapshot of the fall and rise of an empire. And we see it primarily through the eyes of the Caesar character, but it's kind of a multi-POV story about all these crazy inhabitants, some of whom clearly are one-to-one matches for histories of, or figures from Roman history. It's hilarious that like the, you know, the the meme about men in Rome and the fall of Rome yeah, like is, your, is like made manifest in Roman this movie, Empire? you know? Yeah, it's true. Um, and so the movie becomes this weird blend. It's like, it is a kind of historical epic. It is a sort of American political parlor game movie. It is a satire of the media. It is a great man movie. Mm-hmm. It is a kind of Godfather-esque family drama. Yeah. Mm, it's a very schlocky sort of soap opera at times. It is also just borrows plot twists, like literally from Shakespeare mm-hmm. throughout. And it's just like, oh, now we will do this Shakespeare scene. Yes. And then the the narrative will follow that way, which, you know, if you're going to borrow from someone, not yeah. that bad. No, and, and the movie has a lot, a lot of kind of political agitation yes. in it. You know, it has this like, Coppola has been posting on Instagram about all of the film's myriad influences. You know, the David Graeber books of the last five or six years, um, Francis Fukuyama's writing, uh, Herman Hesse novels. Like, he's blending a lot of ideas, candidly not very coherently. Um, And I think what ultimately my... I have a lot of issues with the movie that didn't really work for me. And I like not just the ambition, but the desire to make a movie about something in this time. And to sort of say, like, the world that we've built up, which is full of people who are consumed by their distractions, you know, or consumed by their possessions. Like, that seems to be a big through line of the movie, is we've lost sight right. of not just the American character, but, like, the human character. And that we need to focus on being more connected to each other and more open-minded with each other so that we can go forward together. It reminds me a little bit of the... Um, the discourse that Alex Garland was proposing through Civil War, which you disagreed with or, or didn't appreciate. Danger, Will Robinson. Uh, <laughs> but it is a somewhat similar general idea, you know, and, and obviously Coppola has been talking about this out loud, yeah. and the movie wants to be that. And then what the movie beca- became very quickly clear to me is that it is ultimately only a great man movie about how the only man the man who is encouraging us to embrace debate, but he, the only right. man who can solve the problems is the man who controls Megalon and has all the good ideas, and that is the man portrayed by Adam Driver, who was very clearly a stand-in for Francis Ford Coppola. 
So when you get to that conclusion, you could be like, well, that's dope that an 85-year-old man is like, I'm the only guy who knows how to do everything. It's funny. Right. It's it's Unfortunately, cr- like, then you watch, like, his imagined utopia, which is, you know, like, Megalopolis, the project and the film stands in for his imagined idea of, like, how can we fix whether it's cinema or the world yeah. or whatever. And then you're like, well, this doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? So... Yeah, and there's some, like, mechanical aspects of it that are kind of, like, woo-woo stand-ins for if the world was... If we were all communicating better, the world would be easier because we would be... It would be as though we were gliding on golden pathways. And that is sort of, like, one of the visual metaphors of the movie. But throughout the movie, there are at least a dozen characters, all of whom have, like, clear motivations but odd pathways to those motivations... And the thing that I have been saying to people when they've asked me about the movie is when I watch the Cop- when I've been rewatching all these Coppola movies and when I watch the, the great Coppola movies and even the good ones, even like The Outsiders, it's like he has the most perfectly timed watch in terms of the pace, editing, and feel of the movie. Right. When you're watching the movie, you fall into the movie. When you're watching The Godfather, or at least when I'm watching The Godfather, there is no, there is no movie. I'm in the world. Yeah. It, it is though it has rebuilt my reality to be entrenched in whatever he's thinking. I just saw Apocalypse Now on 70 in a sure. movie theater and I was like, I'm here. I'm in this world. He was the he is the master, at least of the last 50 years, of being able to involve you, almost like cover you in a blanket and be like, we're here together now. Right. And this movie is the exact opposite. It's like the it's like the stopwatch that he had that controlled time. And I say that because controlling sure. time is a key point yeah. of this movie is like five seconds behind. So every scene just feels off. It feels as though the performance style is off. The rhythm of the editing is off. Like it's just not, just doesn't, do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. To me, what stood out, and and this is informed a lot by interviews that he's given and also reading the um, Sam Watson book Mm. and, and the chapter is about one from the heart in particular, which, um, He's fascinated with artifice and uh, an artifice as a way to control and make a better, whether it's movie set or or world mm-hmm. at large. Mm-hmm. But it's like he's running away from realism on that project and trying to imagine like, you know, like and here's all the things that technology can do for us in the different like new cinema or, or whatever he's mm-hmm. talking about, which does seem to change every day. And this movie feels similarly like that. And he's talked about he he wants nothing, like no realism, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. That it is because it is imagined and our minds have to be open to understand this new version of the world and how we communicate to each other and what it could be. But it's it still feels incredibly artificial to me which is you know ev- the way that everyone speaks to each other is clearly intentional mm-hmm. and very declamatory and confusing mm-hmm. um they don't feel like real people the every single visual decision as a result of it is baffling well some of it looks like it's shot on a cheaper set and some of it is just digitally created right. and so i mean the movie that i thought of and i've seen other people say this while i was watching it was the phantom menace where the first time you sat down to see the new george lucas star wars prequels where there was so much digital photography digital imagery in inside the world of the movie where our brains were not quite at a place where like total green screen had been accepted it felt very similar to me. And because of that, the confusion of that visual environment, the acting performances also felt very strange. Right. Like everything just feels a little off. And it's so disorienting when you're watching yeah. a movie. So the point I was making before about like falling inside of his movies, right, but while watching this movie, I was like, I'm watching a movie. In fact, I'm watching a bad movie. And I hate that I'm, feeling. I'm watching pieces of movies and yeah. I'm watching all of the choices that you're making. And I'm wa- wondering like when this came in and I'm wondering what led you guys to do this scene right now. And I'm wondering why you left that taken where mm-hmm. someone just absolutely flubbed the line. And it, like, that literally also, happens in that this That literally movie. happens. And I'm like, was that intentional? Like, did did you guys just not notice? Like, you don't actually know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it the, the choices become very apparent, which is the opposite of what you're saying, where you're just, you watch Godfather, Godfather 2, you're just like, 
conversation. You're just in with those people. Yep. Um, but what's interesting to me is like that kind of seems like part of Coppola's goal. Um, yeah, I think you're right. And and that is when I start to get. I mean, I'm not disappointed in myself because I don't think it works. Like at some point, like the execution on mm-hmm. this, but it just like didn't happen. But I do feel sad that I he's he's swinging for something and a combo of it doesn't work. And maybe I don't I don't have enough imagination to go with him. I don't think it's that. I mean, I think it's okay for there to be failed experiments. Of course, his career is defined by people declaring yeah. that his experiments are failures and then they are ultimately reclaimed and repraised and lifted up to become the pinnacle of the art form a year later, five years later, a hundred years later. It's possible that Megalopolis will be reclaimed as some sort of masterpiece. The thing that it does that I like is that it is an attempt to blend the past of cinema with the future of cinema. Like the the idea itself is Fritz Lang's Metropolis, a very clear kind of inspiration stand in for this movie or the films of Charlie Chaplin or Sergei Eisenstein or, you know, the filmmakers who kind of like invented cinematic language and pushed it forward but did so using that artifice that you're describing. That's a big part of this movie. There are a lot of sets and physical objects that look almost like hyper real so as to be fake. And then there is all this digital imagery that is this like George Lucas, James Cameron style invention of reality. And putting those two things together, I don't know that it has ever really been done like this. You know, the Wachowskis have done some things that kind of feel like this. I think of like even Edgar Wright movies sometimes, the like hyper reality of Edgar Wright movies feels like this a little bit. Those actors tend to get better performance, or those directors tend to get better performances out of their actors. And that's kind of an issue with this movie is the unevenness of all of the performances. But I like that he's like, I'm going to use montage and rear projection and forced perspective shots and all of these things, these like technical choices that he's making to pay homage to the history of movies and to try to do something new. That's fucking cool. But I have the same feeling as you, which is like, God, I would like to like this. And am I like, have I, do I have I lost my edge that I can't find yeah. a cool way into liking this? But watching it, I just didn't like it. I, I w- just wasn't well, invested. I mean, as you said, there's nothing wrong with a failed experiment. And I think some of some of the history homage works. One of the casting choices, which is Adam Driver, works for me. I He's mean, very like, good. It's, I mean, it, you watch this and you're just like, Adam Driver can like do anything because everyone else, and it's not their fault, but they're incredibly at sea. He he is blessed with more interiority and opportunity to perform and to develop a character than I think a lot of the other people in the movie. But I think a lot of the a lot of the technical experiments and the I I both some of the physical production and the digital imagery just like aren't good enough. You know, like it just it's like it just doesn't and that happens. You know, you try things, but like it's not good enough. They don't work well together. The the narrative is both very clear, which is like this guy's just gonna build a new city, you know, and it's gonna be great, and he's gonna be right. But like an hour and in, also, you like forget that you don't even know what really what we're on about. That's I mean that's true, and there and there are a lot of confusing backplots for him and for literally everyone else. Mm-hmm. But you know where it's going, mm-hmm. right? And then at the end, so so the narrative is both completely muddled but also very simple mm-hmm. and the the tone just it it seems like they picked a different tone every day on set i think or did they pick it in the editing room i well, you know let's talk a little bit about the performances because you mentioned that adam driver is giving what i would describe as like a kind of classical um coppola performance like a coppola the man at the center where he's yeah. sort of like He's reserved, but very proud. He has flaws, but ultimately his idea is the most, the the idea with the most integrity and the way that the the sort of the old, his understanding of the old tradition with the new way. That's a huge thing. The Godfather is all about like the old version of the mafia is dying. Michael can take it into the future. Michael knows the way. Like this movie is very much in conversation Mm -hmm. with that. Um, Apocalypse Now is very much about the old way of waging war and the new way of waging war. You know what I mean? Like this is the thing that he's always doing this. And his performance style is like Al Pacino, is like Marlon Brando, is yeah. like Robert Duvall in all those movies. Like, it is that sort of, like, it is quiet and stern, and there's, like, a bit of smarmy sarcasm in there, but, like, it's a Coppola protagonist part. Right. 
But then you look at the, all the other actors in the movie. You look at Natalie Emanuel, mm-hmm. who I would just say is a little in over her head in a movie full of like very, very talented actors. And she is a perfectly fine actor, but being asked to convey like literally Marcus Aurelius quotes and to feel like a woman who through the course of the film is meant to evolve the most and to become like this sort of central I mean, Madonna birth figure. And yeah, I, I don't think she I quite guess lives I don't, up to I, that. Th- whether or not she's supposed to evolve is, you know, who do you where where do you place that responsibility on the actor or on the on the on the writer or the person? I I turned to you about two hours, no, like an hour and a half in, and I was like, I just simply think that Francis Ford Coppola should not put women in his films. I, don't, I, don't, I like I yeah. With there are a couple exceptions that we're going to go through, but it's and you know sometimes it's a casting thing which we'll get to i'm you know i've got one last godfather you know okay. in, in me to okay. to advance it once again okay. but also the the characters characters with a couple exceptions either don't make sense or just not there in the classics what i wrote down here are men are good leaders and smart and women should have babies and resent their children or fuck for power mm-hmm. that's like kind of the the dichotomy between the male and female characters yeah. in this movie. Yeah. There are men, there are some flawed men as well, but there are so, very few women who are like any, who are, there's anything good about them unless they want power or excuse me, unless they want to have a baby. Right. Um, that's, if you look through his filmography. I No, that's what, that's, I agree. He it's a little ungenerous. Really, really it's a know. little old fashioned. And they're also supposed to be objects of uh, love and a different type of, ideal and and utopia Mm -hmm. and that the Francis Ford Coppola character that is a stand-in in in almost every movie he's ever made can never quite get there and do justice to his imagined idea of what a relationship should look like but he believes in it which there's sort of a romance in that this movie is. is also dedicated to his late wife Eleanor Coppola and um there is a dead wife character in this so which I don't think is like one to one timing but it it looms over all of it, it does. so i think he would like to have different ideas about women how about and he would like to get to a different place in his life i mean most um, most of his just, best movies are about men closing exactly, doors but on like women yeah. all of the movies they just aren't really there and when they're there they yeah. don't make a lot of sense sorry we'll talk about the abortion scene so i i just i i just simply think he should make movies about men that's okay sometimes do what you know. There are there are men in the movie. Yeah. I mentioned Giancarlo Esposito, who I think is fine in this movie. Giancarlo Esposito has never been bad in a movie or TV show in his life. That's true. And he has presence. Uh, he, he does. That- I wish this character was a little bit more complex. I wish he was as well-written as Caesar is in terms of his, like, kind of storminess and being torn between two ideas. He's a little bit of a caricature of, like, a man who's like, the old way is the best way. And that's the only way I know how to communicate. But, you know, this is a sort of... Roman history, manque. So because of that, you have to have these kind of figures of tradition that are fighting against the new way. So I understand why he is. Yeah, the way that he is. he's also a little bit like one of the bureaucrats in the Nolan Batman movies, who I can never tell apart. And you guys bring all of your history, so you're like, oh, well, sure, Harvey Dent will then do X, Y, and Z. And I'm just like, I don't know who that is, but it seems like. It's a guy who works in government who's not totally trustworthy. <laughs> and then all these all these sets look a little fake, you know, in that in that comic booky way. This is not dissimilar from yeah. that. Um one of the interesting things that came out during the uh press before the release of the movie was that Coppola said that he wanted to bring in people from all points of view. He wanted to bring in people who are on the right and the left politically. He wants to be, bring in people from different walks of life. And he wanted to bring in the canceled and the uncanceled. And so in this movie, you have varying degrees of canceled, I I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Shia LaBeouf, Dustin Hoffman, Mm -hmm. John Voight. Mm -hmm. You know, all three of them obviously hugely accomplished actors, but actors who have complicated public profiles. Um, I will contend that there's only two actors who really are in the right movie here. Okay. But it's not the movie that Coppola wanted to make. But I would argue that Shia LaBeouf and Aubrey Plaza are actually in the movie that this movie should have been. Which is to say that this is a really outsized and preposterous, over-dramatized, operatic satire of wealth, greed, consumption, 
all these other ideas. Yeah. And that everybody else in the movie is trying to be in a serious Francis Ford Coppola movie. I guess maybe John Voight occasionally seems to have gotten the tone. But Shia LaBeouf, for example, plays this the son of an extremely wealthy banker, John Voight. And he is a kind of a stand-in for a Trump-like figure, a kind of populist aspirant leader who is wealthy, who's trying to kind of take the power back from the man who's I been granted power. I thought he was a, uh, a junior. Or a Don Jr. Yeah, yeah, Could yeah. Be a Don he, he screamed John Jr. to me, but sure, Could yes. be a Don Jr. I mean, Donald Trump once upon a time was to his father, like a somewhat that, similar figure. That is figure. correct, yeah. So, now, Shia LaBeouf, who's an actor I've always liked, despite whatever horrible I mean, things we've read about him in the world. I, I always thought he was very talented. Um, I think brings like a kind of viva- yes, vivacity absolutely. to the movie that is it's sometimes missing. Again, he has, he just has sort of electricity and I, you know. He does. He, he, and it, Seems to be very difficult to live with day to day, but you yes. put it on screen. Yes. And it is really powerful. Respectfully, Aubrey Plaza is just in a Hunger Games movie. This is the one we'll disagree on because I, yeah, I enjoyed I mean, this listen, and I enjoy her. So I I liked what she was up to in this movie. But the, I, I I do. I enjoy her as well. It, you're right. It's a little bit. She's on like Chris and Wig territory where I'm like, yeah. I, can't, I, I can't quite take you seriously. Yeah. And she's playing someone named Wow Platinum, which is an incredible name. And like, <laughs> am I supposed to take her seriously is again, like a question that is like the essential question and also the problem writ large with this movie. So that's why I was bringing up the kind of the Pacino or um, Martin Sheen in Apocalypse Now acting yeah. style that Adam Driver is taking on. Because I know this because I read her say read her read her say it in an interview that she was told to be more like Claudette Colbert or Barbara Stanwyck or a kind of right. like you know fast talking sensual or maybe even maybe even more like Jean Harlow like like twenties and thirties like blonde sexy woman who gets what she wants because of the power of her her appeal. And that, like, that tone, that approach, like, no other actor is yeah, in a movie like that. Yeah, she's still doing her deadpan Aubrey, Pla- deadpan Aubrey Plaza, like, whatever. That's her essence, you know? yeah. <clears throat> and she, and it's not like the script does her any favors. I think you turned to me and made a comment about um, the, the, the portrayal of, of women and truth in this film. Shortly after, she's, like, standing... In a Atlanta courtyard that's supposed to be New York, that's supposed to be New Rome, <laughs> in like some gray getup that they ordered off of Amazon, and then like drops the the coat to just be wearing her gray pajamas that I guess are supposed to be silver. I don't know, and it's like I'll get you, and you're just like, what is what is going on? It's um, and that's not her fault, you know. She's just a character. Uh, helicoptered in from another movie. Right. Um, and it often feels like that when you're watching scenes that are not Adam Driver looking mournfully at a piece of paper right. or a, a digitally created Megalon. Um, yeah. This movie, well, I'd like to sp- speak very briefly about Taylor Swift. Sure. Um, <laughs> I, I have a- Great, this always goes well for you. So I'll, I'll do it carefully. I have a strong <laughs> feeling that- um, Bobby's face right now, even like uh, through the tiny Zoom camera- like on the laptop, it's just. I'm just you know, listening. I, I warned a Bobby. I'm just listening. As always, I'm the first listener of the big picture. That's what I think <laughs> okay. of my job as. Thank you, Bob. And I'm here to listen. <laughs> well, thanks for listening. <laughs> Lend me your ears, as they might say in ancient Rome. Um, I believe that there is commentary about Taylor Swift in this film, and I believe that Francis Ford Coppola believes that Taylor Swift is part of the problem. I'm just putting that out there. There's a there's a a woman who is right. as a part of the bread and circuses. Um, section of this movie, sure. this endless section, this forty-minute section of the movie, in which we go to a kind of created which, like, coliseum. Just, just to be clear, like Sean's not dropping some, you know, basic classics knowledge there. There's just like a very large title card that's like "Bread and Circuses," yes. and then does it maybe say "Bread and Circuses" on the um, outside the building? Yeah, it's very possible. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know whether it does or whether I'm just imagining yeah. that. Madison but, Square um, Garden presents, yeah, but it's like Madison Square Garden as the coliseum. AEG presents "Bread and Circuses." <laughs> Um, I this this big party where there's sort of these wrestling competitions and there is a um Cirque du Soleil style circus act and there is a blonde woman who plays a ukulele who is meant to be the sort of virginal centerpiece of, of the popular Vestal culture. Virgins, yeah. One of the Vestal Virgins. Her name is Vesta. 
Vesta. <laughs> Vesta Sweetwater? Was that her name? I don't know. That's, a, that's yeah, quite a gnarly metaphor. Um, she, to me, I mean, it's any pop star. It's any popular young woman who is meant to distract us from yeah. the way that pop power is getting one over on us. That's the idea there. And that sure. character is then used to show us in a kind of falsified, deep fake style the way that the Caesar character like may or may not be as worthy of his position in the world because of something that Claudio, the Shia LaBeouf character does in the movie. Nevertheless, I find it very funny that, you know, the fake virginal Taylor Swift is like literally right in the middle section of the movie. And they're like, people of the world do not be too distracted by these feckless things. Right. Um, I'm just, I'm, I, yeah, I, I, it's, I, I guess she's, is that, is sort it wrong? Of, she's sort of styled like Taylor Swift. I mean, it's to, like love story era, like teenage girl. Yeah, but it's also like any little pop star that ever did like wore the purity ring or whatever, right, you know, right. it's like the, the Jonas brothers as well. I, she is, she is styled in a very certain way. Um, not on, and she also shows up in the same scene as Francis Ford Coppola's uh, granddaughter. Romy Mars, mm -hmm. who is also a burgeoning pop star and mm -hmm. actress. I tried to start a round of applause for that. No takers. Did you um, think she gave a good performance? She asked questions in the style uh, that the rest of the film was uh, performed in. Right. So, you this know, sort of she on was on With message. what they were going for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Were there any other performances that you liked? Mm. Mm. I mean, Catherine Hunter just shows up about 90 minutes in as the, uh, like, dutiful wife of Giancarlo Esposito. Mm -hmm. And it's just there to be just like, yay, families are good. Yeah. Um, which seems like a real waste of her, even though I agree that families are good. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bold take. <laughs> I like mine. Um, but I was glad to see her. I don't think she was bad. How about that? What about Talia Shire? Oh, yeah, she's great. But yeah. all she gets to do is, like, run around looking mad. Resenting her son. Yeah. And all of his success. What do you make of Megalon? What so, would you do with it? So, what's up? So, here is one thing that I, I wanted to ask. And for a movie that really drops basically all of its plot lines and questions, I don't have that much rewatchable style, like, nitpicking mm -hmm. to do for you. Because, okay. like, the threads aren't that long. But at one point, Adam Driver does have a Megalon eye. Mm -hmm. And then it goes away. I believe what we're meant to believe there is that, well, there's one of the most effective moments in the movie, and this is a deep spoiler for anybody who doesn't want the film spoiled for them at this point, is there's an assassination attempt on his life by a 12-year-old boy. Oh, yeah. A boy shoots him in the eye. That was upsetting. And his eye is wounded. And I believe he uses the Megalon to heal his eye and heal his face. Right. So it's just like, it's sort of a bandage situation. Yes. But then eventually like he does come back. Yeah. And so then and he's, he's fully healed. So I didn't know whether he was like Megalon? supposed to like become one with Megalon and that like we would all become, like know. we would live in a world of Megalon. That sounds like a Transformers movie to me. The other thing I have to say about the eventual Megalopolis that is built is that it basically is that meme of, like, society. <laughs> if, like, I could, you know, take yeah. a If right the Jets on, could make the red. playoffs one yeah, year. Yeah, you know, it's like that. And I'm just like, oh, like, literally, this is the graphic design that was imported <laughs> into the film. So that is tough. Um, I mean, yeah. I'm too online. That's my fault. But that is I, I think that's an accurate call. What happens at the end of the movie. Yeah. Um, well, but Megalon seems nice. You would use it. You think it's like they Do, should have like a skincare line or? So now that's just reminding me of the most recent industry, which is, a, but you know, a couple episodes old now, but great stuff. Great job, Mickey and Conrad. Um, so is it a natural substance? Like, how do we discover Megalon? I I missed that in the spinning newspapers. I, I think it is explained, like but newsies. I can't quite remember exactly okay. specifically how. So are we taking resources away from the earth or from other people in order to make Megalon? Can't, can't say. Well, that's important. Okay. Well, okay. I don't have the answer. So that that's tough. So that, I guess that's one question that I'm asking after Megalopolis, which was the point. Well, there, there's, told me. there's one other important question, sure. which is a question about a question. Yeah. There's a question that is asked at a press conference in a sequence in this movie. 
And that question is asked by a real-life person at our screening. It's actually not. It's lip-synced by a real-life person at our screening while the audio track plays. Mm -hmm. But I was still, I was glad that we got to be a part of that immersive, what have you. One of the ways in which this movie is an attempt (laughs) to be kind of a step forward in the cinema, a new way of seeing a movie, is that at the, I guess, the end of the second act, this kind of conclusive moment, the screen goes all black, and a man at our screening, reached behind the screen and grabbed a microphone, a a a microphone microphone stand, stand. and walked over to the left side of the screen. And then the audio began again and we saw Adam Driver's face on the big screen. And as you said, he lip-synced this question. He did not ask it. So I I, I asked you then, then why did he take out a microphone? But he did. Well, because you were supposed to... At a press conference, does a man have a microphone? You just ask. You just say the question. The person who's talking has the microphone. That's a great. Being, I mean, that's that's a good point. So, what was the point of that? Um, I'm just production managing the, to, the immersive to, experience to add here. To the feeling in the room, which I do think we should talk about before mm-hmm. we move on. You're right, um, he should. was also scribbling something like he was taking notes. Right. He's a reporter, dutifully making yeah. notes um, and not recording the press conference, which is you know. Well. This is the future, you know, and Megalon mm-hmm. exists, but also they don't have cell phones, right? No cell phones. Were there any audio recorders in this future? I I don't remember okay. seeing any. Okay. So, you know. Well, we're back to longhand. <laughs> it's tough. I thought that that was a cool idea that could have been explored more deeply. That's how I feel. The about question it. itself? The, Im- the immersive aspect. Sure. Um, I actually yeah. would have been interested in something with a little bit more heft. When it was over, I was like, that's it? After yeah. reading well, about the, this? The problem is that like it also became so memed so quickly. It was like, yeah. that was the detail that came out of that industry screening yep. that was used to be like, this thing is so out there, there's a person talking to the screen. Which, like, frankly, that is not among the 45 most out there things. Um, no. But... So we were all like waiting for it and everyone in the room got out their phones to be like, oh, it's happening. It's here. Which, let, may I say something? That's fine to get your phone out if you're there for the screening. For and the immersive experience? Yeah. Like what, you know, I saw a lot of, you know, finger wagging mm-hmm. of like, oh, the cinema experience is like totally ruined. We can mm-hmm. never go back. Can you believe all of these people showed up to an event screening of what is basically a meme movie at mm-hmm. this point, and at the big moment, wanted to record it to be able to have their bit online. Mm-hmm. Yes, I can. That's that's what we're that's where we are now. Just want to make sure I've got this clear. You yeah. think that all movie attendees at any screening ever should bring their cell phones and film the entire movie on those phones, and then take that audio and video document and put it on Kazaa for all people to download as soon as they've seen the film. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay, thanks. That's on the record for the FBI. Yeah. Um. I don't know. The energy in the room is important. So I would say roughly, and I, I, Jack, I wonder if this was true for you as well. I would say roughly 35 minutes into the movie, everyone in the, our screening accepted the kind of movie that they were in. We all went in anticipating hopefully something exciting. We knew it could go the other way because there had been, been a lot of negative reviews. But chuckle started. People started openly laughing at, yeah. at some things that maybe were meant to be laugh lines and other things that were not at all. And the absurdity of the movie began to overtake itself. I've seen some people compare this reaction to like going to see a screening of The Room. That was, that was what, what you I said. said to you the minute it closed. Um, before I sat down for the movie, somebody had told me um, that Showgirls was a comp that they had made recently. That Showgirls is this kind of interesting fusion of like incredible vision and um, this sort of outsized acting style, but also like a terrible script and silly plotting. And some pretty awkward deliver, like line delivery, where you're sort of like wowed by something, but laughing at it too, and laughing at its like kind of banality and failure, but also like impressed by some of its artistry. Um, I don't know that this is like, I, I don't think it's a so bad it's good kind of a proposition. But you and I also don't buy into that for the most in the part, same no. way. Yeah, um, I yeah, have the- done like screenings of the room at midnight and stuff, and had fun. Yeah, um, that one I find to be in a very unique place relative to some of the other stuff that people compare it to. But I, I think there is a there's a, a school of movie viewer and culture uh, celebrant that just that does actually f- take real joy in that. And we don't really watch movies that way. Right. I, I did feel and it and it might be that 
the Q&A energy also turned this up. I agree. But it felt like a lot of people came to participate in like a meme as much as a great, you know, cinematic masterwork. I agree. And with you. then, then and I, like, I don't think that's, that's okay. so bad. No, I don't, no, think it's I don't so bad. say that. I don't say that because like, the energy was good in the room. It just was a little like we're laughing a lot now at and, a movie that is about how our society is really, really in a bad place. And the laughter grew as it went on. And at the end, there was like cheering and a couple like fake standing ovations and the sort of thing where, like, on the one hand, it, that that's cool that it was like a bunch of young people wanted to go sit through like a three hour weird experience mm-hmm. by an 85 year old like uh master in decline <laughs> sure that's <laughs> i was trying to that's a good that's a good diplomatic way of putting it um i i uh, see no shame mm-hmm. in that i i don't see it as shame it's just like that does flavor how you receive the movie in real time were people laughing in your screening jack they were uh, I, I think it took a little bit longer in our screening. I would say after the interactive experience, once we're fully into the third act, it was like wheel, wheels were up. And I will say that I go to a lot of rep screenings. Sometimes you'll see something older and you'll have somebody in the audience who will be laughing and that will really get under my skin. I, for the record, was laughing. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. it's so absurd and, and the wheels kind of came off. It didn't the feel act. inappropriate is the thing about the laughing. It wasn't like, how dare you laugh at this? It yeah, was more no, just no, like, no, no, no. Oh, this is maybe this is kind of instantaneously going into a different level of acceptance, celebration, appreciation. You know, we had a lot of very kind listeners of the show recognize us at this yeah, screening. Yeah, which is very sweet. And, and to they, a person, they were like, can't wait for that podcast. Yeah. And I, and think, I was like, you and I are both just like the emoji of all the teeth, like. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is a. It's a it's it's a movie that doesn't work, and yeah. it's it it's not the first time that Francis Ford Coppola has made a movie that doesn't work. Look uh, at you, King Segway. Thank you. Uh, I need my back really hurts, so I need a pillow before we do the next let's part. Let's get of this. you a pillow. I'm Keep a- the mic rolling. This this is fine. Bring people in, but Jack, will you throw me a pillow? Wow, a real time pillow throw. Okay, this is this is movie magic as well. This well, is what it was like on the set I mean, of Megalopolis. You guys can edit this, but it's like you know, it's fine. On guard podcasting, the way that Adam Driver looks straight at the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that feels good. Okay, you good? I think so. Now I have to be like further from the mic, Jack. Am I still okay? This is great. This is this is what Francis Ford Coppola imagined. I mean, you know, bring people behind. Blocking the... is hard. It's not easy. <sighs> okay, I'm good. You got I'm ready. it. Yeah, let's go. This is actually technically not your last podcast before you go. <laughs> so I need to, if, if we're going to have an issue, we should just no, no, stop no, down. No, 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 we're, no, it's fine. It's just like I was trying to have good posture, but okay. I don't have any core muscles now. They're pretty compromised. I see. So, you know, the strain goes other places, but now I've got this pillow. First 10 pods after you come back are just all about rebuilding your core. So it'll just be exercise pods, no table, me and you on a mat on the floor. I honestly think that's like one of the nicest things I could ever do for you <laughs> is to rebuild your core. And what do you so mean? After, like after Knox, I did, if anyone's looking for a program, I use, I subscribe to this thing called Bar 3, no, three, no free ads, but okay. they're great. And, you know, the whole process is about like rebuilding your core after mm-hmm. a baby, like I ever had one, but I did find them very helpful. And then I made Zach do it also because I was like, no, this is going to be good for your back as well because none of us are using our cores. Right, Bobby? Am I right? Uh, yes, that's yeah. correct. We're all just sitting and we're all just hunched over, so, all in pain all the time. You, not me. I'm I'm consuming the great works of cinema. Yeah, but you're and not using rebuilding your core. My core. So if we spent my megalon. if we spent time working on your core strength, mm-hmm. I think you would be a happier and healthier my person. My core strength is right here. Okay. Sean, the brain how, how do you feel about engaging the posterior chain in your day to day life? How how what do you think? What it's what is chain that I care about? Bring it's out Texas Chainsaw you. Massacre, baby. Let's go. I once actually tried to talk to Chris about that. Because he's doing like his mountain man version of my, you know, uh, postnatal thing. And he was like, it, it was like I was speaking a different language. God bless him, you know. And then he's like, I almost blew up my quad. And I was like, I know that's because you're not engaging your posterior chain. Yeah, but anyway. he keeps just going full kettlebell swings, just like yeah. <laughs> not easing oh, into boy. it. He's just going for it. Yeah. Anyway. You feel ready to talk I about Francis Ford now. Coppola? Yeah. Literally, physically supported. Uh, not yes. just emotionally. Yes. All right, let's talk about Coppola. Hall of Fame. Now, you might be saying to yourself, this is a hard 
endeavor. This is one of the great filmmakers ever. You might also be saying to yourself, this How is you really easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't actually have 10 great movies. Um, I think both things are true. Yeah. I think this is a unique case where if you get really entrenched in his career and think about what, what each movie means to the next movie and the previous movie, the 10 comes together pretty quickly. Yes. But I always like to talk about kind of the what we're doing here. We did talk a lot about Coppola's kind of background and career on that episode where we talked about Wasson's book, which I think was back in February, I want to say. I think it was the Driveway Dolls episode where we talked about the book yeah, at length. Yeah, sounds right. So if people want to go listen to that, they can talk about sort of more about like how he got to where he got to and whatnot. But it was interesting to kind of think about what his movies are, what they represent, like what are the signature ideas? Because you pointed out that a lot of his m- movie protagonists are stand-ins for him. And I think that that's very true. But I also think the thing that is a kind of a core premise of Megalopolis is also true, which is that he's constantly trying to break the form of movies and think yes. about a new form. You know, he's trying to think about how to fit theater into movies. He's trying to think about how to fit books and nonfiction into movies. You know, the idea of adapting Joseph Conrad but modernizing it. The idea of taking this like pulpy, trashy kind of stuff, this very genre stuff, and putting this veneer of artistry behind it. I've always found super interesting. Like I just rewatched Bram Stoker's Dracula last night and I'm like, wow, he really, man, he took this material seriously. Like yeah. so seriously, it's absurd. <laughs> um, you know, The Godfather, that's like an airport novel. You know, it's a beach novel. And he made it into something grand and poetic and and deep. And so I I I love his project. You know, like I think his project no, I mean, is one I, of the coolest projects totally. ever in movies. And that's part of like my sadness and reluctance to be like, I didn't get Megalopolis because I, I'm so on board with the Coppola ambition and the let's let's try stuff and let's be weird and wild and let's take gambles, you know, which he does. And sometimes it's Apocalypse Now and sometimes it's one from the heart and Megalopolis, mm-hmm. you know. But mm-hmm. like we have examples of both, and he's very open about the filmmaking process and very open about all the struggles and disagreements and everything. He and is. He, he is both. He is. Um, extremely like well-educated and often esoteric, but also just willing to share with everybody. So loquacious. Yeah. Yeah. And I really like, I'm that's, that's, I mean, he's our, he's everybody's guy, but like, come on. I really, really, I'm rooting for him. He's a fun avatar for the possibilities of movies and his career. When you look at it and you go through the work, you can see like a really clear traditional rise that is mirrored by a lot of his contemporaries or the people who were right behind him in the 70s. You know, certainly like his friends like uh, like Scorsese and De Palma and Spielberg and that whole cohort. But then also, you know, anybody who kind of came up through the 80s or the 90s where it's like you make a movie independently and then you get a little bit of a bigger movie and then you take a studio job and oops, that was a bad idea. And then you take on a movie that's more personal to you and that unlocks you for, you know, he has this like, this arc that is a cliche and he helped set the cliche for that arc. But then after a certain point, after the 70s, he is like, I'm not as worried about maintaining the safety and sanctity of my career the way that other people will be. He seems like less consumed by the in real time legacy and more concerned by the future legacy. Yeah. Which I think is another thing that like really separates him, even from someone like Spielberg, who basically doesn't make bad movies and is always making an interesting movie, even if it's not successful. But you can feel him in real time, like having this kind of commercial sensibility of like, I want this movie to work right now. Right. Watching some of these Coppola movies again, I can feel him being like, I don't fucking, whatever. This is what I want to do. This is what I think is the right idea for this time. Even if people don't get it right now, which honestly, I don't have that bone in my body. That's so fucking brave to do that over and over and over again and to constantly put his own money and his own like, his own sense, like sense of success and sense of self into every project. And even when he's like, oh, I fucked up. I'm super in debt. I got to take on this like John Grisham novel yeah. still brings like a tremendous level of artistry to those movies. So I just think the the actual like parabola of his career is is maybe the most interesting of his all of his contemporaries. And his own documentation of it, again, mm-hmm. is part of like when I called Michelobolis like fascinating performance art that I guess that sounds like a diss or whatever, but he is he is being a filmmaker and an artist like in public in real time and we have access to 
his successes and his failures and his money problems yeah. and his reasoning in a way that for whatever reason, whether it's like legacy building or just being a different type of person who doesn't want to talk as much about it yeah. as he seems to. Well, and I love it. I'm I it's so compelling and interesting. And um, I don't always like process stories, but like the the process of being Francis Ford Coppola and building this weird, wild career is like, I mean, it's, it's, it's a movie in itself. It is. It's never boring. You know, I have a little bit of, perhaps I'm just projecting or speculating, but, you know, he's from New York. There's a certain kind of New York guy from what I, you know, jokingly call like the white ethnics of New York, like yeah. the Irish and the Italians and the Polish. And there's like a certain kind of a second generation, third generation person who is like an oversharer. They're often great storytellers. Yeah. And they often, and I do this in my personal life sometimes, where you like say something that you know you like shouldn't say in mixed company, almost to like provoke a reaction. Right. And also to seem like a little, a little dangerous, a little like, oh, he'll just say anything. And oftentimes when I hear him talking, and he did this with this conversation about this Haitian film that he backed and how much he loves the Haitian people after a crack about eating cats and dogs that Spike right, right, Lee right. made at the Q&A. And then he just goes off on this weird jag about how he, there was, he had a whole subplot about how much he admires the Haitian people and they were a critical part of New Rome. But then he took it out and it's like, Francis, you don't have to say all that. You know what I mean? Like, but I see him as like very similar to a lot of people in my family, a lot of people I grew up around where he's super smart, but he's also super regular. He's super kind of like, he's like a down-to-earth, middle-class yeah. guy who also grew up in an artist family and doesn't know how to stop talking. Right. And so he has given us all this information yeah. about his career. There's so many people who are his contemporaries who are just like mysterious artists who are like, you'll never understand totally right. how I do what I do. But he actually- and how dare you ask. Right. Um, he's more in a tradition of like Orson Welles. Or like if you put a microphone in front of him, <laughs> he's like, I got some stories to tell you. But, but an optimist. That's the other he, thing right. that is really, and that's like, um, maybe, you know, let's have some introspection. Maybe a reason that Megalopolis like doesn't totally land for me at least because it is, it's not cynical. At all. He is still out here like believing in the future and the possibility, especially if you do it his way and let him just kind of <laughs> use the Megalon yes. to sprinkle wherever. But still, <laughs> yeah. th there is a fundamental belief in good in him despite some of the movies he's made you don't share that i think i'm more cynical than him probably yeah, i am as well so so are you i am yeah but I, he's also made and so, so many Orson movies Wells is mad at everybody yeah well he got <laughs> fucked he got fucked out of 20 years of being able to make movies i mean coppola did too in some ways although he often did the fucking he did nobody did more self-fucking right. than right francis ford Which coppola he's like also honestly like pretty upfront about and acknowledges and he it's does. like well yeah i messed that up so most other people would, you know, be pointing blame every which way. And of course, he does plenty of that. But yeah, I think he's done a very good job throughout his career of accepting what he screwed up and also projecting onto the people who screwed him over. Yeah. He's just very open. Um, so it's made for a great career. Let's go through his movies. Okay. Um, I have included here. Yes. The 20 plus features that he directed. Mm -hmm. I think 24 or 25. Yeah. Um, and also the four films that he wrote. Okay. And I think that the four films that he wrote should be eligible, at least for this conversation. Okay. Because, in part because he has kind of this awkward filmography where he's got a handful of indisputable all-time movies that will never go away as long as there are movies. Like, one of, if not the greatest run in American cinema? I was hoping we would discuss that. Well, we'll get to it very shortly. Okay. Let's start at the beginning of his career. Yeah. He starts out... Well, he starts out making nudie cuties, basically like softcore porn. Sure. Um, which is sort of like illicitly distributed in the late 50s, early 60s, and cuts his teeth on that. And that sort of gets him on the radar of like independent movies, and he's kind of working his way up through the system. Somebody who thought he was going to work in theater, whose father was a musician, and he mm -hmm. later worked with on his movies. Um, and he gets into the Corman system, and he makes Dementia 13, which is kind of like a schlocky but incredibly creative thriller like horror it. movie. It's I'd pretty good. I've never seen it. I watched it. I was like, oh, this is good. It's pretty this good. This is better than I expected it to be for like the Roger Corman produced $3 yes. like starter film. It's like a lean 80 minute movie. Yeah. Um, and it's a movie that, you know, I think I watched it for the first time maybe three or four years ago. I mean, COVID. Um, there's a wonderful Blu-ray. 
okay. of it. I'm just going right. to put that out there. Uh, <laughs> Leave me um, alone. I was like, this movie might be in the Hall of Fame. Because it... Are you, are you, I know you love to put the first one in the Hall of Fame. We can yellow it for sure. I, I, okay. genuinely, I really liked it. Um, um, I will say his next movie, which comes a few years later, which is called You're a Big Boy Now, which is a comedy is one of his very few movies that I really don't like. Okay. And I understand why it hit, why it, why it made an impression. It's a very, it is a very contemporary for that time sort of a film. It's like a sort of antic movie, um, Geraldine Page, Rip Torn, Peter Kastner, about like a 19-year-old who's like horny and is like trying to get laid and trying to, you know, move mm-hmm. through the world quickly. It's kind of like, smart guy porkies in some ways yeah. um, <laughs> that's a good way of putting it and it feels like very hip and it feels like kind of Austin Powersy, but it's in black and white yeah um, but I found it like not very fun to I watch I did not respond to it okay so. so then I would say you're a big one I was red okay 1968 Finian's Rainbow this is the big studio job sure that he got now during this period I'll say he is getting a reputation as a writer he has written is this is Paris Burning in 1966 uh, for I believe Rene Clement, and he co-wrote that with Gore Vidal, uh, Jean Orange, Pierre Bost, and Claude Brule. Mm-hmm. And then in 66, he also co-writes this property is Condemned, which is a Redford movie. And Redford and Natalie Wood, I believe, are the stars of that movie. And he's like getting a reputation as a writer, so he's trying to like have this Hollywood screenwriting career mm-hmm. while also getting his own stuff off the ground. In this period, he decides to leverage the success of that by making the Finian's Rainbow adaptation, which is like an old school MGM musical starring Fred Astaire. Yeah. That like stinks. Like it's, it's so bad. Yeah. But I, so I, I had never seen it, watched it, was like, how it, do I know these songs? Which is mm. really, really like they started doing How Are Things in Glockamora. And I was like, oh, of course. Like what? When did this come into my consciousness and how can I replace it with something useful? Anyway, really bad. Petula Clark is also big in our household right now. Oh, interesting. But, well, downtown, the concept of downtown mm. um, and large buildings is very powerful okay. to Knox. So sometimes, you know, a song about downtown oh. also speaks to him. I like that. I like what you're giving him. Um, it's a, movie, it's a, it's a like, show that on paper, you know, it's a 40s production or the original yeah, production. Yeah, well, the musical is, also is your kind is of thing. Ins- I just mean like I mean it's a, but it's also insane. I just like, mean like a glossy musical. Sh- yes, yeah. sure. But it it comes at this fascinating time where you know it's not an MGM movie, it's a Warner's movie, but it comes at this time where like the big expensive musical Broadway adaptation on the big screen right. is dying and is this sort of emblem of the end of the old Hollywood. Yeah. And we're about to go to the new Hollywood. We're about to get away from movies like this. And even here it's like half shot on location and half Francis Ford Coppola insisting on sound stages, which like could be a nod to the classic 40s and 50s, but also everyone just looks. Well, I think I guess maybe Fred Astaire was insisting on sound stages, but Coppola mm-hmm. also likes. I don't know. It's 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 also it's a mess. It's hard to make movies about Irish people. This is one of my takes. Yeah. Um, that movie bombs out. He's got to reset. Two things happen in this period. One, he gets the gig of writing the screenplay for Patton. Yeah. That works out. Which is a bio doc sure. about uh, General Patton. Yeah. That goes on to become a very successful movie and that Francis Ford Coppola goes on to win the screenplay for right. or what the best uh, screenplay Oscar for. And at the same time he mounts The Rain People which is sort of his like return to a sort of independent cinema. It's a Warner's distributed movie but very small contained movie three-hander um, that is more in the mode of the new Hollywood. Um, it's a movie about a young woman who is pregnant and knows that she's not with the right person and sort of in a fit breaks out and leaves her house, comes upon uh, an impossibly fo- young James Con. James Con, as handsome as he'll ever be, as a football player who's had a kind of brain damage. And they sort of connect and sort of don't connect right. and they go on the sort of road trip together. And it's interesting that a lot of the filmmakers from this era all have their, like, sensitive woman's picture. Right. But just one. You know, like, Scorsese has Alice doesn't live here anymore. Sure. You know, yeah, like, yeah, 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 
yeah, yeah. Is this a very I mean, listen, odd movie in the live. arc of his career? Listen, they're yeah, like, women's they're, lib for they're, sure. They're plugged in. Yeah, they're paying attention. Let's burn those bras, no doubt. Uh, <laughs> I guess this it works out okay for her. Sort of, no, not really. In this movie, oh, there's some gnarly stuff. No, at the end of this some movie. gnarly stuff happens, but it's really it's it's mostly to Jimmy Con. Yes, um, I think it's a pretty good movie. I liked it. Yeah, I think it's. It has eight. I felt its age a bit more than some of the movies that are considered classics from this period, uh, but it's definitely a huge step. I think we could give it like a respectful yellow, but like the kind of more of like an orange because it's not going to go in. But okay. we, we respect it. I was wondering about that whether or not this one would make it in. Okay, I like your I like your respectful okay. yellow. Well, we'll do that. Now I feel the patent should be in. What shade of? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. I'm good with that. That's an, he won the Oscar. Yeah, that makes sense. It 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 basically like bumps his quote up so mm-hmm. much that he becomes a significant player in right. Hollywood because of writing that screenplay. Okay, so that's green, and then Rain People is like, um, what what is like a respectful yellow? Like what shade of yellow to you? Mm, Marigold yellow. Okay. What oh, marigold. There, that's, marigold. Yeah. That's there nice. you go. Yeah. That's lovely, Bobby. As though we're sprung from Finian's rainbow. Right, correct. A marigold, exactly. a marigold yellow for his next movie. Uh, so we've got our first green in Patton. Right. Which I think is, I think you got to do. Yeah. He doesn't really take on a whole lot of for hire writing after this anyway. I'm good with that. And then you get to the 70s. Yeah. And you get to this like, so 1972, The Godfather, 1974, The Conversation, 1974, The Godfather, Part 2, 1979, Apocalypse Now. I mean, Bobby's already greened these, which is correct. Yeah. Um, Do you want to put up a fight on any of them? Is there anything you want to... No, are you, are you kidding? Yeah. Uh, I was actually... So when we redo these, you mostly try to rewatch the things that you haven't seen or that mm-hmm. aren't familiar. But like Same. as a treat, I gave myself like... I was like, oh, I'll just watch part of Godfather. Like, watched all of it. Watched all of Godfather too. Ooh, you know, good just for you. like these are the only two movies that I didn't revisit. Well, why would I've seen you? Them so many You've times. seen them so many times, yeah. as have I. But at some point, it's just like you know, I can get Zach to come sit with me for thirty minutes. Then I was, I had a long drive, and so I put on. I think I did Godfather two rewatchables this time. Mm, yeah, which is I that like it. Every Christmas, you guys get together and do like a really deranged four hour boys movie podcast. Mm. And I wanted to know what this year's would be. I don't know. You got to ask Bill Simmons. And then I was also reminded that Bill is with me that um, his contention is that Kay doesn't make sense as a character. My contention is that Diane Keaton is miscast as Kay. Um, You're both wrong. Okay. I mean, I love Diane Keaton. She's one of the pillars of American cinema. She's one of the most critical characters in that story. And she is She is is important in the character. But then Diane Keaton is just like standing there being like, what? She's the eyes and ears of the movie. All the the Cosa Nostra is mysterious to us. I mean, unless this Shiksa woman comes in and is just like, what are you guys doing here? What is all this fucking weird tradition? Because that's how most people would feel if they were confronted. I I have thought about this long and hard because Bill and I have thought about this many times over the years. But I, I believe that Kay is a an essential movie character. I think that Keaton's plays her with too much naivete. Perhaps you're right. Um, Don't and, agree. Perhaps you're right. And, and, or daffiness, which some of it is mm-hmm. just like, I also can't disconnect it from like, you know, the Diane Keaton that I know coming forward. But there is just something that is like, this must all <laughs> end! Listen, and the the time, I, you know, I the scene in the kitchen when she says bye mm-hmm. to her kids and then Pacino shows up and the door just closes on her is like the most painful thing I've ever seen in my entire it's life. Profound. Yeah, but I, I don't know. Okay. Bill's right. She just like leaves all the children in the bus and is like, sure, no problem. That part is funny. <laughs> That's not ideal. I would, I if like, my child were on that bus, I would not be excited about like, that. Like you haven't thought about... <laughs> What, where this guy has been in Italy once. That's how enchanting Michael Corleone is. I mean, he, Pacino is unbelievable in those movies. He's beautiful. He's so beautiful. And like, so, I mean, it is one of the great performances of all time, but he's so young and so powerful. And so I understand that, but it's like, she's not that dumb. She's got to <clears throat> ask like one or two questions, you know? So you can't pretend like you didn't know everything. Um. I mean, I'm I'm not going to debate the K thing all over again with you. You know, I need anyway, to be a part of this. You should do like a, a minute by minute Godfather podcast and where you sort every decision that's made into good decision and bad decision. Okay. What yeah. if we just did the K files where we had like a telestrator with every scene featuring K? 
Where you're just like, why this? Why this? Why this? Do you think people would enjoy that? Yeah. No, they wouldn't enjoy it because Kay is good and she's needed. She's needed. It just, I th- I think someone else could give the performance some more shade. Okay. That's all. Do you think Aubrey Plaza could do it? <sighs> no. Okay. Again, I, I again, historically speaking, I don't really love his casting choices when it comes to women. Understood. Uh, 1974 is the conversation. The Godfather's going in. Yeah. The Godfather Part 2 is going in. Yeah. 1974 is the conversation. Rules. This is a remarkable movie. Obviously, all four of these movies are certified classic in the in the movie canon. Ooh. Conversation, one of the more prescient movies ever made about surveillance culture and who's listening and what it means to spend time listening and watching other people yeah. doing things that you're not supposed to be watching. And also making assumptions based on what you see and hear and thinking you know what's right and what's not right. That's the thing that I take away from that movie when I watch it again. It's all about this surveillance expert named Harry Call, played by Gene Hackman, one of his best performances, maybe his best performance. And he is a person who is perhaps the world's greatest bugger who spends most of the movie observing a conversation between a man and a woman who are clearly in some sort of illicit affair and thinking that they are the target of something. Come to find out that's not totally the case. And his delusions and paranoia and anxiety, but also concern for the characters is fascinating because I feel like every day on every podcast that we make here at The Ringer, we watch something, game, sure, interview on a talk show, movie, and we're like, here's what that's about. I know exactly what that's about. And we don't know fucking anything. Mm -hmm. And that movie is a great reminder that you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You know what I mean? Just like reduce your surety around all things in the world because it's much bigger than just like, oh, wow, he knew that like the surveillance state in the NSA would be listening to us. It is that, but it is something much bigger than that too. So I find that he's really good at, you know, cool movies about the paranoid 70s. Like, that's great that he did that, but his most of his movies have something much, much deeper going on underneath the surface. That's my speech on the conversation. Yeah, but it is also like the fact that this is comes out in 74 mm-hmm. in the middle of the paranoid 70s. It's like thumbs so, fingers so directly on the pulse and doesn't he get to make the isn't the conversation like what he barters with he's like I'll do part two Godfather part two at this and also like an opera yes Um, with Paramount yeah what a legend it's amazing I mean it's fascinating that that's the kind of thing that he wanted to make and I feel like there's this push pull and we'll feel this as we get into the 80s on what he wants to be doing and what he feels he has to do as a filmmaker um the Godfather 2 comes out. It's as much of a success as the first Godfather. Widely acclaimed Academy Awards. No one's ever been as high on the mountaintop of movies as Coppola is after the kind of twin killings of these two movies. Right. And so he sets out. His next project is to make Apocalypse Now. Much of the Watson book is about this kind of twinned feeling between the Apocalypse Now production and Megalopolis. It being this vast undertaking. It being like a... a tremendously bungled production, you know, like speaking of that surety right. and that sense of like, I can do it, no one else can do it, which he brings to every production too. He's just in way over his head. He almost kills himself in the process. He almost right. kills Martin Sheen. I was going to say. <laughs> you know, like it's a really, it's a, one of the truly most traumatic movie productions in history. And then on the other side of it is a is a breathtaking movie, a movie that is unlike any other movie. You know, I find The Godfather the most fun movie of his to watch. It's the movie that I kind of like yeah. I feel like a kind of like pop culture energy when I'm watching it. But Apocalypse Now, which I just saw at the Egyptian on 70 recently, that is like church. That is like going to a spiritual place that's very deep. Um, and it's also a, everything that he is doing in terms of filmmaking techniques, innovation, the sound in particular. Mm-hmm. Like they are stuck in the jungle for a very long time and things are going incredibly wrong and he doesn't know if he or his cast are going to survive, let alone be able to produce this thing in the, in his head that is also changing, mm-hmm. you know, on set. Like, he is doing a lot of, well, maybe it's this. He's finding the movie in real time in a lot of different ways, but it does come together. Uh, amazingly so. It, um, and it, again, once again, there's, like, a lot of bad press in the lead-up to the movie. And then it premieres at can, And it's widely acclaimed. And it yeah. does well. And, and it, it's probably even bigger than people would have thought at the time of its release now. Its sort of legacy is huge now, but that's automatic. So that leaves us with five movies. Okay. And we've got a long way to go here, but yeah. not as many sure things, I would say, through the next roughly 40-some-odd years. 
So three years go by between Apocalypse Now and his next movie, which is One from the Heart, which you've referenced a couple times. Right. This movie's maybe back on some people's radars because he has recut this movie recently. It was back in theaters last year. It's now available on Blu-ray called One from the Heart Reprise. And this is a kind of a kind of a shoebox musical. Mm, it's a m- movie starring Frederick Forrest and Terry Garr about a couple in Nevada who are trying to make it work and can't make it work. And a couple in Las Vegas. Yes, in Las Vegas. But recreated painstakingly to his exact specifications, all on sound stages with with beautiful neon lights and like in a really intentional, as you said shoebox like proscenium design um this movie which he poured a ton of money into we should say while this is all happening he's got american zoetrope which is his production company which remains today right and has gone through various stages of success and failure at this time he's got several other movies from several other great filmmakers that he's producing or not producing for lack of a better phrase and he's also trying to get this movie off the ground. He's got Vittorio Storaro, the incredible Italian cinematographer, shooting it. And, you know, it bombs hard. It bombs basically as hard as a movie can bomb. And, and the, the financing, to me, because I've seen Hearts of Darkness and the, and the Apocalypse Now experience has been so well chronicled. Like, this part of the Sam Wasson book was by far the most stressful because they lose money 40 different ways, 40 different times. Um, And then he's always just like, no, we need to import this case of wine from wherever. You know, and Gene Kelly is just like around teaching dance numbers to no one. And you're just like, what? It's really, really chaotic. Mm -hmm. And then people don't, it does not, it does not perform. It cost $26 million to make. I think it was originally intended to be a $10 million movie. Yeah. So it went almost three times over budget and made 600 grand. Yeah. From the guy who who had previously brought you Godfather, the conversation, Godfather Part Two, and Apocalypse Now. Um, it's, a fa- it's a fascinating fall. It's one of the fa- most fascinating falls in movie history. He takes it very hard. He takes a huge financial hit on this. Um, the movie itself, I have some appreciation for. Yeah. I, I saw it one time on cable when I was a kid and didn't get it at all. And I will say, being in love and being in a relationship makes you understand this movie more. I feel like he's writing from a very honest and strange place in this movie about this couple who are trying to figure out how to be together and when they can't figure it out, like what happens to them. Some of it just, it's very similar to Megalopolis though in that it's like he tried something that can't work cinematically with the way that some of the musical numbers are staged and the acting style at times, which is like sometimes between Frederick Force and Terry Gard, it's very naturalistic. Right. And, and sometimes other times it's, it's very, we're, we're doing either melodrama or we're really underplaying it. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're making you aware that we are performing. Exactly. The artifice that you were describing before. The Tom Waits soundtrack is so amazing. The songs are good. Um, and it does look beautiful, especially... You know, that this is why when I like, I like, I, my eyes do not understand Megalopolis. I'm like, is it me or is it Megalopolis? Because I I don't think that this was appreciated as something beautiful to look at. So when I was in Philly for the Rewatchables live tour, I had a down night and I went to go see Reprise yeah. um, in a movie theater. And it was a good experience. One, the the new cut, has shaved off about 15 minutes from the original. Right. Which I think is a very good choice because I feel like movies are really kind of languid, um, the original cut. And the new one is pretty tight. It's like one hour and 33 minutes or something. And there's a moment when Nastasia Kinski and uh, Frederick Forrest are outside looking out into into the stars sitting in a car. Right. It's like just oh, yeah. beautiful. Also, he was like, I don't know if he was having an affair with Nastasia Kinski, like, but... There's, He's in love with her, and you yeah, can feel it when you're watching and the movie. It's like very complicated, and yes, He's uh, had his fair share of affairs. Yeah, um, uh, very stressful part of the book. I don't know. I I think this probably won't go in, but I, I think it should be at least the yellow, yellow, because this is a bold it, move. It is, and it's also a useful reference point for certainly for Megalopolis and many other things that happen. Most people haven't seen this movie. I would encourage people to check yeah. it out. Um, the next two we should do together. Okay. The next two come out in the same year. Yeah. They're in some ways the same movie. Yes. 
They're both adaptations of S.E. Hinton novels. Yes. They they both feature Matt Dillon and Diane Lane. They do. And yet, stylistically, they're completely opposites. We're talking about The Outsiders and Rumblefish. Mm-hmm. Two great movies about teenage rebellion, the illusion of love, right. um, <laughs> danger. Uh, Gangs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brotherhood, the, the, the ideas of brotherhood. Reasers. Yeah. <laughs> Having cool jackets and wearing t-shirts with the really sleeves rolled up. It's confusing now, because yeah. I feel like Jack and Bobby, like you guys didn't have to read any S.E. Hinton in elementary school. Oh, you, you did? did? You oh, did? Jack. Did you read The Outsiders like, in school? Why are we reading, why, like, why are, like, greasers such a foundational part of an American education? Well, I... They, I like, they represent like something interesting sure. about reje- rejecting norms. I, that's not true, but it's like in. I vividly remember watching The Outsiders, and then there are class elements to it too, as well. But I mean, The Outsiders has this like legendary cast of young actors who went on to become big stars. Right. You know, uh, obviously Tom Cruise is in this movie, Ralph Macchio, Rob Lowe, Matt Dillon, Patrick Swayze. I'm just doing this off the top of my head. I know there's a bunch more. Um, Patrick Swayze in this movie. And then Rumblefish is this sort of like uh, like the art house companion yeah. in a way, shot in black and white, shot with this very unusual perspective on the characters. It doesn't look like really many other movies. It looks more like a German expressionist movie than it does like a but it's teen still, gang movie. But it still manages to communicate all of the themes and emotions and the teenness of it. Yeah. It just looks very beautiful, which is why I vote Rumblefish. So that's the thing is, could could they both go in? Well, do we want to cheat and do a I don't, slash? I don't think they can be one. Why not? It's our, it's ours. When okay. we make top fives, we do it all the time. Do you think we have enough to get to 10? If, especially if we do that. I'm not sure if we do. It's debatable. There's a couple um, that I will strong arm, but there's not a lot. We have five right now? We have five. But with maybe one from the heart. Bob, Bob one from the heart should be yellow. Yellow, yeah. I, I would, why don't we yellow them both for now? I like your, I mean, Rumblefish is the film that I think has gone on to become more celebrated. The Outsiders is a more conventional and Hollywood it's also, movie. It, it's an example of him making stylistic aesthetic choices that actually pay off. Yes, and you elevate know? the material. Yes, yeah. Yeah. and you you aren't kind of lost. In the main, you know, but that's, and Sofia Coppola is also featured. She is. This is her first acting performance. Mm-hmm. I might argue her best acting performance. Um, I think she's in The Outsiders for like one line also. Okay. Uh, the Cotton Club. Now, my wife and I started watching this movie yeah. this week and she was like, I hate movies like this. <laughs> movies where guys talk in old timey accents and shoot each other. I don't like this. And uh, I understood where she was coming from. It, it is a lot of people just talking in rooms. The restored version has some more musical performances. It does. And those are nice. The I like those Club a lot. Cotton Club Encore. Yeah. Yeah. I think good performance from Gregory Hines in this movie. Diane Lane has never looked more beautiful. Yeah. She is uh, ecstatic in the movie. I think it's a real miss. Like it's not a movie it that I've never really, really liked. Yeah, it's dull. Um, and maybe a little bit of that Megalopolis thing where it's like, it's cool that you went for this, but it doesn't work. Um, but it, like, it makes sense. I'm just like, I don't really care about this. I like, could never You're back in a room wearing suspenders, just like arguing with each other. And then... There's Maybe something shooting. very artificial about it too. Yeah. You know, it doesn't look like the characters' costumes are lived in. It doesn't look like the world is lit. There seems to be something um, artificial yeah. about a lot of what you're watching. So I would say Cotton Club is red. Agree. I've, I've kept Captain EO in here. Sure. To discuss it with you because Captain EO is one of the signature pop culture documents of my youth. I, like so many kids in America at this time, Loved Michael Jackson. Yes. Had every Michael Jackson record on in the house. My parents loved Michael Jackson, my mom especially. And we, like so many families, went to Disney World, mm-hmm. Epcot Center. Yeah. And we watched the Captain EO film. I think we did too. And it was, it fucking rocked. Now, I haven't seen this in a long time and I did not revisit it. For Nor this. did I. But this is yet another example of Francis Ford Coppola saying movies are not just one thing. Movies can also be only shown at Disney World and 17 minutes long starring the most famous person on the planet. I'm obviously open to this as a pop cultural enthusiast and a and a reflection of his embrace of the, the wider canvas. Now, he's obviously doing something like this because he's like, I am down bad financially and I really need to get paid for, to make the 17-minute Captain EO movie, which will be shown exclusively at Disney World. Or maybe it was also at Disneyland, but I think it might have only been at Disney World. Um... 
the whole backstory of this movie is very interesting. Uh, and the sort of like attraction and in theater effects that came with it were, were really fun. And it would be fun to be able to experience that again. I mean, obviously given what, where Michael Jackson lives in the culture now, something like that's never going to happen again. But as a, like, as an experiment, I feel like it's a yellow. Totally. Okay. Oh, I thought you were trying to argue, go straight to argue for green. No. Yellow is absolutely. No, but it, it and like, uh, this is actually more pertinent, I think for you guys. Like, do you guys even know what this is? Jack and Bobby? You guys don't know what this is. Yeah. I mean, they built an entire attraction at Disney World that ran for years um, that featured this film and like surrounding Was it at Disney around. World or was it at Epcot? Well, Ep- Epcot is in Disney World. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I went to both, but I guess I, I am not familiar with it's the It's one of the centerpiece spaces of so, Disney Right, because World. there's Magic Kingdom and then Epcot and together they are. Correct. Okay. And, you know, water parks and all that right. other yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. But, Do um, they have separate mailing addresses? Zip codes? I'm pretty sure that the, I mean, I haven't been to Disney World in a long time, but the the big globe, the big circular yeah. Epcot globe thing, I believe is right smack in the middle of Disney World. What is considered like the Disney World parks, the way they're all connected. I'm sure there's like some Disney geeks listening that are like, please, you're fucking this please, up. Please, please don't add yeah, us. Just email Amanda Dobbins at amandadobbins.com. Um, Captain EO's yellow. Did you rewatch Peggy Sue Got Married? I sure did. So I didn't rewatch this one. I haven't yeah. seen it in a while. What is, I was hoping you were you would well, have rewatched it. Well, I mean, this is the, one of the exceptions where it's like Kathleen Turner is like very good at acting. She's great um, in this movie, as and I she's recall. very good in this movie. And this is right in the sweet spot of her stardom, too. Yes, and this is also like late '80s Nick Cage being super weird, but mm-hmm. also being late '80s Nick Cage and like so so charming. Yes, Francis Ford Coppola's nephew. Yeah, and they. The, I, and somehow Kathleen Turner was eventually sued by Nicolas Cage for defamation for her description of his performance on set. Needless to say, they didn't they didn't get along. I believe okay. he won and she had to apologize. It's tough. She's a little uh, loose with her personal commentary. Yeah, but that's what makes her great. You enjoy that. Yeah, yeah of course. Yep. Um, she's good and it, it is interesting in that it is like a like a revisitation of the 50s like outsiders rumble fish world but mm-hmm. both from the perspective of a woman and also from the perspective of of age because yeah. the premise of the movie is that she like wakes up and is back in her high school body and reliving like her high school choices so a little bit of post back to the future mania in this movie to me yeah it's 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 good, and she's good in it. It feels like a very, as I recall, conventional and somewhat impersonal, high-concept Hollywood 80s movie. Yeah. Relative to the rest of the stuff that he does. Now, I haven't seen it in a long time, so maybe if I rewatch it, I'd be like, oh, he's putting this and this from his perspective into it. But almost all of his movies, you're like, he's obsessed with this. That always felt like one that he didn't seem as, as sort of broadly entertaining as it is, and it was like a modest hit. Right. It's also just sort of a four-hire Right. Experience. Right. Like he directs it, but he doesn't write it. And But to this point in his career, he had so few of these. Yeah. You know, like even the outsiders, which you could say was for hire, he's pouring like his own perspective on 50s and 60s America into those movies. Um I don't think it's gonna go in, even though it's like a solidly no, it's, good it's movie. Solid. Yeah. Um have you had a chance to see Gardens of Stone? I I did for this podcast. Good for you. Um this is a very dour drama. And also very personally sad for him because his son, Gio, dies during production. Yes. And I guess it's fitting that a movie that is effectively about graveyards um, would happen at this time in his life. Uh, I find this to be one of his most uh, devastating and quiet movies. Yeah. I don't think it's a Hall of Fame contender, but it's a movie that I like to recommend to people because so few people have heard of it. It may be the most obscure movie in his career. Um, it also does explain why D.B. Sweeney is in Megalopolis. It certainly does. In case you're curious about that. He has a critical part in it, as does the late James Earl Jones, who just passed. Um, and it features just great stuff from James Conn and Angelica Houston. Yeah. Um, they're both really wonderful in this movie. It's about a, a, a Marine who essentially like tends to the cemetery where uh, fallen soldiers are buried and is going through a kind of like effectively a midlife crisis, a kind of like personal sadness, and is trying to figure out what to do with his life. Um, good film. Probably not. Probably red. Okay. You want to, you want to yellow it? No, that's fine. I think if you had an overwhelming passion for it, I would, I could go with you on it. 
I, I don't have an overwhelming passion. It's very okay. sad. It is. 1988 Tucker, The Man in His Dream. Mm-hmm. Another movie that he had long planned. This is the most one-to-one I Am Tucker movie, like I Am Tucker circumstance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where like the lead character who is an auto designer who is attempting to upend the Fords and GMs of the world by creating his new car. Sees the future and believes in the power of technology. And and thinks he knows what people want, even if they haven't seen what it is yet. Um, This is a movie that he had tried to get made for years and couldn't get it made until George Lucas came along and helped him get it made. And... It's very good. It is a very. It is sort of like the great man version of the Peggy Sue Got Married, where I'm like, this is a good movie. There's no doubt about it. it. I mean, it is also in like a lot of ways, and 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 overly simplistically, like the key to understanding Francis Ford Coppola, the autobiography, and, and yeah. Megalopolis, mm-hmm. and everything that he's tried to do since. Yes, I mean, only I think only one Academy Award nomination, even though it seems like the kind of movie that people would love. I think just like his standing in the culture. It's part of the reason why this movie was not as warmly it's received. Also, it is very conventional. Mm-hmm. And then there is something sort of bewilder- bewilderingly optimistic mm-hmm. about it, given how it turns out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's fair. <laughs> I mean, as you said, that's, yeah. his, that's his mode <laughs> that's of operation. that's his thing, which, yeah. which is fascinating. So it is sort of like a, a Rosetta Stone for him in a lot of ways. But it's like... I, you know, it ends basically with a parade and we did it. And then, spoiler alert, like a, a end card that is, he died six years later and every company that makes cars now uses his technology. You spoiled the film. I said spoiler alert. Um, I think this kind of has to go in as, yeah, as like as a well. stand-in for yes. his point of view on the world. Um, especially because I do not think that 1989's Ghost Sto- or New York Stories segment no. will be going in, no. also starring his daughter, Sofia Coppola. Yeah. Um, that- she has other talents. She has many talents. Um, speaking of acting in her father's films, it just doesn't happen to be one of them. The Godfather Part 3, a movie I like. I don't like it. Okay. Even before sh- she International shows up. International Why is Al Pacino's hair like that? Oh, I love it. The spike up—it's so upsetting to me. Oh, if I could do and that now, also, I would do like, it today. No, yeah, no, and yeah. it is the Egon also Spengler. Like, I love that haircut. I hate it, and it's like only I guess fifteen years have passed, but Pacino has gone from the Pacino of Godfather Two to like whoa, and yeah. I'm just like, I this is really upsetting to me. No, mm, the Godfather Part Three is a misfire, but it is very commercially successful and actually gets a number of Academy Award nominations. Yeah. So even though it is done in part for money and in part to get back on track and get out of debt. And this is sort of around the time when he's starting to develop, I think, some of the wine strategies yeah, that yeah, are going to yeah, kind of yeah. elevate him out of this stuff. He start, he goes basically into like his paycheck era. It dovetails nicely with Bram Stoker's Dracula, which I think is great. I was expecting you to put it in and you can have it if you want. I would like to put it in. Great. Um, I think it's like a very bold adaptation. I think the performances are uneven. Keanu, my apologies. You're a little bit out of your depth against Gary Oldman in this movie, but uh-huh. Gary Oldman is wowzers good as Dracula. And when he and Winona Ryder, this goes back to my please yeah, respect yeah, yeah. Winona no, thing I know, where it's like I'm just like, Beetlejuice, I'm, Age I'm, of Innocence, Dracula, Reality Bites, like all in this like five, Heathers, all in this five-year window. I'm like, she, come on. Yeah, like, these very are, powerful, but you know. But very good and very good taste. I mean, really like working with the best filmmakers and right. having interesting performances. She ruined The Godfather Part Three, but. That's fine. Well, she made up for and it with Bram Stoker's Dracula. Well. Yeah, it would. The Godfather Part Three with Winona would have been confusingly interesting. Okay. Um, what was the verdict on the Godfather Part Three? I think it's red. Yeah, I don't like it. So Bram Stoker's Dracula is in, and also just a good horror movie. You know, in addition to being a bold adaptation of a that's cool, famous man. literary it's your work, thing, you know, okay. it is my thing. 1996 is Jack. I did not rewatch this, but I did see it in 1996. I did it as well. I saw it in movie theaters. Yeah, of course. Uh, We were of the age. I recall enjoying it, honestly. Yeah. Um, I do remember it being pilloried by critics as like, what has become of Francis Ford Coppola taking on this tripe. Right. But I thought it was funny. And then I was doing some research and read a quote from him. People being like, he he gave a quote saying, people were like, why did you make Jack? Why are you making a Disney movie? Mm -hmm. And he's like, I wanted to make it. I had a nice time. Fair enough, Francis. Respect. It's red. Yeah. 
Um, 1997's The Rainmaker. Are you going to make a bid for this? I am uh, This no. is an adaptation of a John Grisham novel starring Sorry, Matt, Matt Damon. Damon. You know, good at, once again, he's really good at calling shots mm-hmm. on actors. Mm-hmm. This is fairly early. Megalopolis. Yep. Um, this is pre-Saving Private Ryan, but post-Courage Under Fire. Matt Damon. Right. And Good Will Hunting comes out the same year. So mm-hmm. he's like in the mix. But I mean, I enjoy this movie. Like, what is... Uh, it's, it's not like marigold respectful yellow, but mm-hmm. sort of just like, I'm glad it exists yellow. I'm not very good at my, like, canary yellow. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Canary yellow it is. Ten years go by, no movies. Mm-hmm. 2007, we get to this critical point, and I wish I had said this earlier when we were talking about Megalopolis, but if you want to understand Megalopolis the most... You should watch you should, Without Use. You should, you should watch one from the heart. But if you oh. want to understand it a little bit more, I think you should watch all three of these next movies. Because these three yeah. next movies and their style and what interests him, stuff has changed. He's been through a lot in his life. He's had a tumultuous professional and personal life. He's lost a child. His kids have grown up and they're going on to their own successes. He's been through a lot with his wife. And he becomes extremely reflective. And all three of these movies are very reflective movies. And they're all not quite great, but they're but all pretty, aspiring hard to something different and interesting. And pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So Youth Without Youth is an adaptation, is a sort of adaptation of a novel about an older man who all of a sudden moves back 30 years in time. And it's an adaptation of a novel that someone gave to him because the novel was relevant to his ideas for Megalopolis. That's right. Um, it stars Tim Roth I, I, all three of these movies I like and don't love. I think Youth Without Youth is probably the most successful for me. I agree. I don't know if I like feel like it makes sense in the hall, but maybe it does as like the last piece of his trajectory. I mean, it is, and not just because of like, it is like very thematically related to Megalopolis and I don't know if it helped me understand Megalopolis anymore and even he when like talking about this film Mm -hmm. was like it was part of my studies for making Megalopolis but it's also also in many ways like the total opposite of what Megalopolis is Mm -hmm. which is true I guess not I mean not entirely there are elements it's an exploration of of time Mm -hmm. and whether time can be manipulated or whether we can move through it and also love and also fascism. Mm -hmm. Um, Is there any architecture? Absolutely. Well, is he he an architect? No. Yeah. But I mean, sure. I mean, it's filmed in Europe, which Mm -hmm. is also great. Uh, (laughs) Like that, that's another thing. It's just, it's, it is, it is realist except for the kind of sci-fi parts. So I like it a lot. Let's yellow it for now. Okay. 2009's Tetro. Yeah. Which is shot in black and white. Um, stars Vincent Gallo. Speaking of casting mm-hmm. canceled people before they've been canceled. Uh, this is a movie about a young man played by Alden Ehrenreich whose ship breaks down in Buenos Aires. Right. Which is where his brother lives. And his brother is Gallo. And this is kind of like a little bit of an ode to Fellini, a little bit of an ode to like um, the European art house that he likes. Very seems Seemingly a very personal story um, that I always felt a little personal distance from, like I never totally clicked with this movie, but it did. I think it probably got the best reviews out of these three movies from this period. It is so so grounded. It's, yeah, it's very beautiful to look at. It is sort of melodramatic, mm-hmm. but when you have been the gal and really all the Aaron Reich, who I think is very good in this, like mm-hmm. playing it very close to the to the vest, it like makes it slightly less over the top. It's interesting because it does also feel like he's working through some of his own family issues, agreed. you know, throughout it, which makes it interesting. It was supposed to be Joaquin Phoenix in this movie. Oh. Joaquin Phoenix bailing on movies back in the news. Yeah. But um I wonder if this movie would have hit a little bit differently, especially I feel like Aaron Reich and Phoenix feel more like brothers to me than Aaron Reich and Vincent Gallo do. Yeah. Um it's a good movie, not a great movie. It's probably it's probably not going in. I don't think it is either. Let's read that. 2011's mm-hmm. Twixt. Never seen it before until this past yeah. week. 
This is a movie starring Val Kilmer about an author in a small town who is exploring um, local murders. This is the movie that feels the most like Megalopolis to me in terms of its like awkward tone. Yeah, that's fair. There's like kind of like a clumsiness in this movie. Some of it is very beautiful. There's a lot of photography. We should say um, Mihai uh, Malamere, who's the um, Romanian cinematographer who has been filming his movies since this new period in Youth Without Youth, has like an interesting sort of awkward eye to me too. And so the between the pacing and the way that these movies look, there's something very odd about them. There's some, there's this sort of like otherworldly Edgar Allan Poe stuff in this movie that I feel like is very beautiful but doesn't work well in the story. No. And then the stuff that's said in the real world looks bad, but the story I'm more interested in. So I find that the movie is, a, again, a cool experiment that doesn't work. But if you're looking to figure out like how did the guy who made the Godfather Part Two start making movies like Megalopolis? This will yeah, help you at least a little like, bit visually and tonally. Yeah. Yes, and then I think Youth Without Youth is sort of the thematic. Yeah. So Tetro and Twixter out. Yeah. Megalopolis, you think is out despite achieving? Well, so that's the question, right? What line will the word Megalopolis appear on in Francis Ford Coppola's obituary, which I hope is not published for another twenty five years? Um. I mean, is it his last movie, you know? Oh, I would imagine so. Then it's quite a summation mm-hmm. in a way. I feel like in terms of calling your shot, it could, it should go in. I agree with you. Even and, though, the, and the narrative project. I will see it again soon. I do, what if I, I come in and I'm like, I figured it out. I, mean, I have discovered way, the truth right? in Megalopolis. It's like I, you know, it like it brought me no pleasure. What's that Louise Mensch tweet about? It brings you know, so and so will face the death penalty, which I don't support. You don't remember this? This was I don't like know. Chris Ryan's Louise. favorite. Louise, thing. Louise was recording her pod here. You know, in Spotify it brings Studios. me no pleasure to say that I didn't get it. Um, but so I would love to be proven wrong. Well, I mean, I got it. I just don't. Well, <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, I think it, let's put it in. Okay. I like it. And that leaves us in an interesting place. So if we count the greens we've done so far, if we include Patton, the screenplay for Patton, you've got The Godfather, The Conversation, The Godfather Part 2, Apocalypse Now, Tucker the Man in His Dream, and Megalopolis. That's seven films. We need to pick at least one. And you counted Patton, right? And I counted Patton, yeah. So that's seven, including Patton. That's eight, including Patton. Oh, eight with Dracula. I missed Dracula. So eight. So then we need to choose two more. Mm Mm-hmm. My instinct here. Yeah. Hmm. My instinct would be to do Rumblefish and One from the Heart. Mine as well. I mean, sorry, that wasn't dramatic podcasting, but. I think it's okay. You knew, I mean, we could also be ourselves, mm-hmm. make our own rules, mm-hmm. and do Outsiders Rumblefish together, mm-hmm. One from the Heart, and then. That doesn't help us. That's 10. No, no, no. Is it? Yeah, because we already had it. Oh, okay. So, right. So, we could do that. So, if you, in, in your own mind, the powerful Listen, mind of Amanda Dobbins. I'm breaking, I'm making up my own rules just like Francis Ford Coppola. Absolutely. So, why can't yeah. I? we do Outsiders Rumblefish? Outsiders backslash Rumblefish. Okay. It's been allowed on lists before in this in this podcast. Yeah. It's our world. Well, when we're tried at The Hague, <laughs> we'll have to a- acknowledge openly that right. we put 11 films on our 10 film list. Well, we do it all the time. When you're put to death. when It's what Francis would want, you know? <laughs> he doesn't believe in the strictures of 10 films. He doesn't. Um, he's had a remarkable career. Just to, just, to, just to go through it one more time. Yeah. The films in the Francis Ford Coppola Hall of Fame are Patton, The Godfather, The Conversation, The Godfather Part Two, Apocalypse Now, One from the Heart, On One Line, The Outsiders and Rumblefish, Tucker, The Man in His Dream, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and Megalopolis. Amanda, we're going to miss you on this podcast. I, I hope you come you back. Oh, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> me too. I'll think about it. Okay. Uh, this is neither any- the last time Amanda's recording nor the last episode that Amanda will appear on in the actual chronology of the podcast. I know, it's true. Things get really, really yeah. interesting from I think here. We, we have banked a, a great many episodes. Yeah. Amanda has been very flexible in her scheduling during these pregnancy months. We have a lot, lot, lot in the canister. So you're not really going anywhere. Please don't bring up canisters. 
<laughs> okay, that's that's all I ask. I when when the, when the child comes, I will yeah. bring a beautiful meal served in a canister. It will be. A, I also I got to figure out how to do voice memos. I mean, I know how yeah, to do them, yeah. but. I get pretty nervous when it's just, do you want me to do it in iMessage, Bobby? Or can I do like on the voice memo app and then send it to you? Voice memo app and send it in an email so it doesn't disappear. Okay, that's great. So so there we go. You know, that's just, that's a whole new medium of podcasting that I'm, I'm about to unlock. You. I'm really excited. Yeah. Uh, interesting timing here. You seem to be missing the episode about Joker Fully Ado, which will be coming to this feed later this week. Yeah, Van Lathan so, have, will join me. Do you have a screening lined up? I do on Monday. <gasps> Oh, okay. Yeah, it's called an early access screening that I bought tickets to, which is something I just do now. Oh, wow, because the press screening is not... Warner Brothers, email me. Yeah. Come on, guys. Let me know. When um, when can I see this movie? Yeah. Uh, Van and I are going to talk about it. I'm excited. You will be missed. I will. I will. Maybe your first voice memo. I will definitely no, because I won't be able to see that one. But I'm definitely going to listen to it anyway. It's exciting. Should be super normal. Thank you to Jack Sanders for his work on this episode. Thank you to our producer Bobby Wagner for his work. We'll see you at Joker Two.